Let's go to our base scriptures, Isaiah 62, 6. Isaiah 62, 6. I'm going to see how much I can get covered tonight. And tonight is a special night because, number one, we're going to worship God. We're going to enter the Holy of Holies. We're going to get di- how many of you want to get direction from God? Amen. You're going to get direction from God tonight. Amen? Number two, we're going to have an impartation at the very end where we lay hands and release gifts and anointings. And who knows? Some people might just explode in speaking in tongues. We'll see what happens. <laughs> God is so awesome. Here we go. I, God, have set watchmen. Everybody say watchmen. Who are these watchmen that are on your walls, O Jerusalem, who will never hold their peace day or night? Who are these watchmen? Angels. God has put angels to watch over you. What are they watching? They're watching what you pray. They're watching what you say. They're watching what you do. They've been assigned as your assistants. And based on what you pray, say, and do, they go to work. They're not waiting on the Father to give them instructions anymore. They're waiting on you to give them instructions. So they are the watchmen. And it says, they are His servants and by your prayers. Everybody say, my prayers. Mm, That's why they're watching your prayers. By your prayers, they move or they don't move. So your prayers have to be scriptural prayers. I think we were talking about that at lunchtime. If you're going to pray... Everybody say, do it right. right. We don't want prayer just for the sake of prayer. We want prayer that gets results. Can I hear an amen? Amen. That's what we want. So you've got to learn how to do it right. Put the Lord in remembrance of His promises. How do you put the Lord in remembrance of His promises? Everybody shout, "The the Word. If you pray the Word, now you're putting the Lord in remembrance. Now, why do I have to put the Lord in remembrance? That's a good question. Does God have a short memory? Did He forget? No, he didn't forget. The reason you have to put the Lord in remembrance is because the angels hearken to the voice of the Word. Got it? So when you speak the Word in your prayers, when you speak the Word out to God, guess what? The angels start moving. Your focus is not, hey, I want to see you angels. Where are you? Do this for me. Do that for me. Your focus is, what does the Word say? And the Word says that you've given charge, Lord, to your angels to protect me lest I dash a foot against a stone. What did I do? I spoke the Word. What did the angels do? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's one of His promises. We've got to, that's the Word. We've got to go protect them. Are you getting a hold of this? So that's how you instruct and guide your angels. Now, uh, come with me to why do angels listen to you? Angels listen to you because you have been moved to a higher position. Uh, After the fall, what happened? The angels actually were higher than you and me because man fell from a high position down to just above the animals. And then what happened? Jesus went to the cross. And when Jesus went to the cross, look at what happened. We'll put that diagram up there. Jesus went to the cross and you got elevated. You have now been elevated. We'll put that diag- There it is. Yeah. You got born again. This is tell you what the, the Bible looks like. It's a very simple diagram, but the cross represents when Jesus uh, came. Before the cross was the Old Testament. Everybody say Old Testament. Old Testament. And that was under the law. They were human beings. Everybody say human beings. human beings. What does that mean? They couldn't do anything. They had no power. They had no authority. So They had to pray to God, and God took care of them. And it was a future event. But the moment Jesus went to the cross, and someone accepted Jesus, guess what happened? You are no longer a human being. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that Jesus came to live in you. Where? In your body? No. In your mind? No. In your spirit. And when He came to live in your spirit, your spirit came alive. And now Jesus came with a package deal. What does that mean? you got the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the glory of God, the grace of God, the anointing of God, the power of God, and even the kingdom of God. Everybody shout, I'm loaded. See, that's why you're a spirit being that's loaded. The other guys on this side were human beings that could do nothing. And not only did he do that, but uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, You have given your life to Christ, so you have become a new creation. Everybody say, new creation. creation. The word creation in the Greek is a species that never before existed. That's why old things have passed away. 
That's why all things have become new. What does that mean? No more generational curses. Your past has, say this after me, my past has absolutely nothing to do with my present or my future. I mean, you don't know what I did in the past. Who cares? If God don't care, certainly don't tell me about it. <laughs> Amen. Your past is, and I hate to say this, but you need to understand, your past is irrelevant. The devil will try and make you remember your past so you don't focus on your future. What is your future? God's got a good plan, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Amen? Amen. A great plan for you, but you won't see a great plan if you keep thinking about your past. Did you ever notice that they, when they build cars, the front windshield is a whole lot bigger than the rear view mirror? You ever wonder why it is? It's supposed to look forward a whole lot more than you look back. Say this after me. When I focus on my past, I waste my future. Mm. Don't waste your future anymore. Okay, so you become a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Now we go back to that diagram. Well, before we go back to the diagram, come with me to Ephesians 1.17. Let's go to Ephesians 1.17. Paul is praying for the church. This is called a prayer of supplication. Intercession means you're praying for sinners. Supplication means you're praying for Christians. And Paul's praying for Christians in the church in Ephesus. And this is what he says in Ephesians 1.17. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you a spirit of wisdom. See, you don't pray this prayer for a sinner. You pray for them for the scales to come down so that they'll come to know Jesus. You pray for them to get saved. So this is a silly prayer for a sinner, but this is a perfect prayer for another Christian. You don't pray for a Christian to be saved. They're already saved. So what do you need to pray for Christians? That they will get a spirit of wisdom and revelation into the knowledge of God. They will grow in the Word. That's why this is called the prayer of supplication not the prayer of intercession. All right. Grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, insight into the mysteries and the secrets, into the deep, intimate knowledge of Him, which you get from the Word of God. Verse 18. Next verse. Next verse. By having the eyes of your heart. So that tells me, first thing that tells me is, everybody say, my heart, my, heart. my, spirit, my spirit has eyes. Has eyes. Not these. Your spiritual eyes. So your spiritual eyes need to get opened. Your spiritual eyes need to see something. How? By the Word of God. Through the Word, my spiritual eyes will open. Remember I told you, you have five physical senses, but you have five spiritual senses. You can see in the Spirit, not these eyes. You can hear from the Holy Ghost, not these ears. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That ain't this mouth. You have five spiritual senses. So now you see the eyes of your heart. This is the word pneuma in the Greek. It means your spirit. The eyes of your spirit are flooded with light. What brings light? Everybody shout, the word. The more word I see, the more light I got. So that you can know. Everybody say, I need to know some stuff. What do you need to know? The hope. Everybody say, the hope. The word hope literally means God's earnest expectation for you. What is God's earnest expectation for you? What is God's hope for you and for me? This is how God sees you. The hope which He has called you and how rich is His glorious inheritance in the saints. So you have an inheritance coming because somebody died. He was your big brother. His name was Jesus. And when He died, thank God He left you an inheritance. But if you don't know it, you have an inheritance. Rich uncle died, left you a million dollars. But you don't know about it. So you're the brokest millionaire out there. So we're going to need to know our inheritance. Yeah. Here we go. What is our inheritance? Next verse. So that you can know and understand, this is your inheritance. Everybody say, immeasurable. Yeah. What does immeasurable mean? Can't measure it. Unlimited. What does unlimited mean? Has no limit to it. What is it that was so big that was immeasurable? That is so big that is actually unlimited. Hmm surpassing greatness of His power. Everybody say, God's power, God's power. Is, unlimited, is unlimited, immeasurable, immeasurable. And, in me. and in me. That's why the people in the Old Testament didn't have that. 
Don't wish to be Solomon. As rich as he was, he wishes he was in your shoes. Why? Because he didn't have in him the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the glory of God, the grace of God, or the anointing of God, or the kingdom of God. You got it. Amen? So that means that power is in and me and for me who believe. Everybody say, the power is in me and for me because I'm a believing believer. We got a whole lot of unbelieving believers out there, but you guys are believing believers. Amen? All right, as demonstrated uh -huh, in the working of his mighty strength. When was this power used? Let's see. Next verse is the example. Mm. Which he exerted. What did he exert? The power. What power? Immeasurable, unlimited. And what happened with that power? Exerted where? In Christ. Everybody say, I'm in, I'm in Christ. So when you're in Christ, whatever happened to Christ, happened to you. Exerted in Christ. Wow. When he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So Christ was raised from the dead. I've done a study on this. The Holy Spirit used one arm. That's it. To raise Jesus from the dead. Seat him in the throne room. One arm. That's how much power was used. And guess what? When he did that to Jesus, he did it for you. Go to Ephesians 2.6. Ephesians 2.6. Raised in Christ... And what happened? What, what's that got to do with me? Well, he raised us up together with him. With who? With Jesus. Raised us up at the same time. And what did he do? He made us sit. Mm. Made us sit. I, I love to demonstrate this because people don't understand. Brother, would you come in and give me a hand for a second? This is my buddy. So God got a hold of you from your earthly seat and dragged you high above everything, sit down right there on the top step, and made you sit, put you in a throne room, a seat with your name on it. You didn't have anything to do with it. You didn't earn it. You didn't pay for it. You didn't work for it. You were just minding your own business on the earth. And guess what? God grabbed a hold of you, took you all the way to the throne room, and put you in, made you sit in the throne room. And said, by the way, this seat has got your name on it. Why? Because you're supposed to be the king that he is the king of. The Lord that he is the Lord of. He put you in the center of all authority and power so you can reign in life. Are you getting a hold of this? You had nothing to do with it. Why do you keep looking at your circumstances from your earthly seat? Why don't you look at them from your... Well, when I get to heaven, when I die, I'll get into that seat. No. He put you there now. Made is past tense. He's not going to make you sit there one day. You have that seat now. You own that seat. Do you know who owns the seat next to Jesus? I've never said this before. Are you ready? Everybody say, his bride. Everybody say, that's me. You're not going, you're not, the, you're not, you're not Christ's fiancé. Some of you will get that on the way home. You are not his fiancé. You are his bride. In other words, the ceremony was finished when you gave your life to Christ. You're already his bride. And the seat reserved for Jesus was the right hand of the Father. The Son, the only begotten Son. And the seat reserved next to Jesus was for His bride. And you are His what? Mm, are you getting a hold of this? And you are seated at the center of all authority and power. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And so He put you there. Everybody say, I got a seat. Got a seat. In, the In the throne room. To rule and reign. Rule and reign. In this life. Oh, Brother Nasser, there's no scripture that says I'm supposed to do that. Well, why didn't you look at Romans 5, 17? Remember that. Before you tell me there's no scripture, I'm going to give you one. You know that, right? <laughs> Romans 5, 17. We'll come back to Ephesians. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace and the free gift of righteousness. If I shout, that's me. What will we do? Let's find out. Putting them in right standing with himself, we will what? Reign as kings in life. Why? Why am I not reigning? You're still sitting in your earthly seat. 
How will I reign? Start taking your heavenly seat. From your heavenly seat, you can change circumstances. Why? Because in the heavenly seat, you are... Fa- well, let's go back to Ephesians 1.21. This is what the heavenly seat represents. Authority. Authority. You have not only power because you got filled with the Holy Ghost, but you have authority for the seat that you're sitting on. Far above what? That seat is far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, and every name that is named. Everybody say, COVID is a name. name. You're above COVID. Come on now. Understand your authority. Uh Uh-huh. Not only in this age, I love this part, but also in the age to come. That means that seat is yours for eternity. You'll never see it anywhere else. It belongs to you because you will reign for millenniums to come with Christ. Amen? Thousands of years you're going to do that. God's got this seat for you. He's already arranged it. You're the bride of Christ. The only thing that didn't happen yet was the reception. The ceremony occurred. (laughs) The reception comes when Jesus comes. And we're going to have an incredibly big reception. We're going to have a big party. Get ready for what's about to happen. Amen. All right. Next verse. And he has put who he. Everybody say the Father. What did the Father do? He put, not you. He put every problem, every situation, everything under your feet. No, no. That says under the feet of Christ. Who is the body of Christ? Who is the feet of Christ? Even if you're, even if you're a little toe in his body, it's still under you. Amen. Every problem has been put under your feet. Stop worrying about stuff. God has not fallen off the throne. He actually knows what he's doing. Oh my goodness. And he managed to r- rule heaven without you. So you might as well chill out and relax. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Oh, watch this. He, he has put everything under his feet and appointed him the universal head of what? The church. When Jesus walked the earth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he was the head of Christ and the body of Christ. Today he is just the head of Christ. Who is the body of Christ? We are. We are the body of Christ. Amen? And that's why we're seated with him. Because we are his body. To carry out what he wants done on planet earth. And to carry it out, we need power. So he gave us the Holy Spirit. To carry it out, he put us in the throne room, the seat of all authority. So we can now use that authority to change this world. Not just leave this world, but to change this world. Amen? Thy kingdom come. Where? On earth, as it is where? In heaven. Amen? Who brings his kingdom? The body of Christ. We are to change our world. And to help us change the world, guess what? He's put us, he's given us power, and he's given us authority. And he's given us the third thing. An army of angels. Not one angel, not two angels, an army. Everybody say an army. That's why, oh, what's happening here? No signal? Hmm. Well, can we get it back? We got it back? Oh, oh we, we lost it. Oh, no, we got it back. Okay. Mm. Put back this diagram, please. He's put all things under his feet. Now, look at the diagram. Over here, the black dot on the left side represents man on the line, which is planet Earth. But on the dot on the right side is way higher. Why? Because you're seated in, in your heavenly seat. Okay. On the left side, man's got no power, can't do anything. He has to ask God for everything. On the right side, guess what? Everything was already done. On the left side, it's under the law. On the right side, it's under grace. What does grace mean? Everybody say, it is finished. A definition of grace is very simple. It is finished. What is finished? Everybody say, everything. You don't ask God to come back to the cross because there's people that are unsaved. Salvation for all mankind was finished where? At the cross. Healing for all mankind was finished where? At the cross. Prosperity for all mankind was finished where? At the cross. That's why you up there look back to the cross. The arrow points back. For the man in the Old Testament, their blessing is a future event. 
For you and I, our blessing, are you ready for this? It's heavy now. Our blessing is a past event. That might explain to you why grace is not what God is going to give you. Grace is what God has already given you. It's past tense. And that might explain why faith hmm, is not believing. Anybody know what faith is? Believed. Duh. <laughs> because grace is past event, faith has to be past event or it doesn't work. The word faith is the word pistis in the Greek. The word believe is the word pisto in the Greek. Both of them are past tense. What do I mean by past tense? You, can I make it simple? You got to believe what? That you receive when? When you pray, not when you see it. In other words, can I make it real, real, real simple? Everybody say, I got to got, got it before I'm ever going to get it. That's what faith is. I got to got it before I'm ever going to get it. And if you got it, you're about to get it. But if you ain't got it, you ain't going to get it. So you better walk, talk, and act like you got it. That's what faith is. Why is faith past tense? Because grace is past tense. Everything you need is already on the earth right now. He not going FedEx ain't going to pick up from heaven. It's all here. You access it by faith, past tense. Everybody with me so far? So now you're starting to see. Now what's this got to do with angels? It's got everything to do with angels. Come with me to Malachi 3.11. I like to re repeat. What did we find out this morning? I said repetition. Everybody, everybody say repetition, repetition. makes permanent. What does that mean? You hear it over and over and over again, you get it. So I'm going to live this now. Okay? Repetition makes permanent. In the Old Testament, Malachi Old Testament, God says, I will rebuke the devourer because you got no power. So I'm going to take care of the devourer for you. But come New Testament, things have changed. Come with me to Matthew 16, 19. Mm. Jesus said, I will give you, I will give you. Hmm. Everybody say, I will. I will. Number one, that means he's going to do it. Number two, I will. Will is a future event. I will shake Pastor Todd's hand. So I, dictated, I said what I was going to happen in the future. So he said, I will give you something. When was that given? When he went to the cross. What was he going to give us when he went to the cross? I'm going to give you something called the keys of the kingdom. Not the keys to the kingdom. The keys that came from the kingdom. That's why it's not the word to. It's the word of. And one of those keys that you're going to get after I get off the cross is that you will bind. You don't need me to rebuke nothing. You don't need me to get rid of sickness. It's already done. You don't need me to rebuke the devil from attacking you. You will do that. It doesn't say that God will bind. It says you will bind. You will loose. And what are you going to bind? What we've been learning this week? Fallen angels. Demons. Devils. Powers and principalities and rulers of the darkness. You don't need God to do it. You are in the position of authority now. You can do this. That's why he says that's going to happen in the future where you will do the binding. And guess what? You must bind, declare to be improper and unlawful. How do I bind anything? By your declarations. You don't physically tie anybody up. You simply speak. That's how you bind. And what am I going to bind? Mm, what did Jesus do? The whole Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he was binding and loosing, binding and loosing, binding and loosing. Now, I don't remember Jesus ever binding. Oh, well, let's go find out. Let's go to Matthew 8, 16. Let's see if he did some binding. Hmm. We'll come back to this in a minute. When evening came, uh-huh, it comes, they brought to him many who were under the power of what? Demons. Hmm. What did he do? Fight the demons? No. The Bible says, and he drove out the spirits with what? A word. Not a sermon. A word. Not 300 words. A word. What was he doing? Binding. What happened when he bound those demons? People got healed. You know that sickness doesn't come from God. You know that, right? 
There's no sickness in heaven. The devil puts sickness on people. And you know what? If the devil is doing it, somebody has to bind him. So many times we pray for the sick, but we haven't bound the demon that brought it on in the first place. So let's do some binding before we do some healing. Yeah. Amen? Because yeah. what happened when he bound all those demons? The Bible says, and he drove out the spirits with a word. And what was the end result? Restored all to health. Jesus did this because he had the power to bind and loose. You now have the power to bind and loose. Good news. You have the power to bind demons and get people healed. Bad news. Why haven't you done it? You got a truckload of people at work that need to get set free. Do you know there's a truckload of Christians that are bound by the spirit of fear? God says, I haven't given you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. That fear is an actual spirit, it's a demonic spirit. Used to be an angel, now is a fallen angel. It's a demonic spirit. And it's binding Christians in fear. You've got to bind that spirit of fear and set people free. God's going to do that. No, He's given you the power to do that. Does that make sense? That's how we're going to win the world. So if we restore to health. How do we restore to health? Bind the demons that brought that sickness in the first place. Now you're going to get it done. Go back to Matthew 16, 19. That's where we were. Who does the binding today? Everybody shout, we do. Because we are in that seat of power. Now, angels are under you. Before you got saved, you were under the angels. In that hierarchy, you were just above the animals, but you were lower than the angels. Oh, you're not getting this. Let me show you the scripture. Where is it? We'll go there first. I want you to see this. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I know it was in the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Hebrews, here we go. Hebrews 2.7. Hebrews 2.7. For some little time. And I say little time. little time. You have ranked him. Who? Him. Man. That's why it's not a capital H. This is not talking about Jesus. Not talking about God, man. For a little while you ranked him lower than who? The angels. Now we've been seated in the throne room. We're higher than the angels. Are you getting a hold of this? Just for a little while we went way down here in the hierarchy, just above the animals, but way lower than the angels. But that little time is over. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we were raised. Raised to where? To sit in the throne room, the center of all authority and power. For a little time you have ranked him lower than the and inferior to the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the work of your hands. Mm. You, set you. That's why he put you in the throne room. Manage that part of God's world that he put in your care. Ask of me and I will give you what? The nations. The word nation is the word ethnos. What does that mean? The ethnic group of people that are around you. Love China, but you don't have to go to go China to get somebody saved. You could find some people on the street out there that need salvation. So when he says, give me the nations, what he's saying is the ethnos. Use the power and the authority you got to change your nation. What is my nation? The group of commonality. That's what the word ethnos means. The people you work with, the people you hang with, the people that live on your street, your acquaintances, the people that you know, change their world. Because that is your mission field. Go into all the world. Start with your neighbor. Amen? That's what we're supposed to do. And we've been given Jesus. We've been given the Holy Spirit to guide us. And we've been given an army of angels to get people saved. Amen? That's why you have that. What, this is what you're supposed to do now. You're not lower than the angels anymore. Okay, where were we? We were in uh, uh, Matthew 16, 19. Is that where we were? Yeah. There we go. Matthew 16, 19. 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom, whatever you bind. Not what God binds. Whatever you bind. How do you bind? Declare with your mouth what is improper and unlawful on the earth must be, must be what? Whatever is already bound in heaven. Sickness allowed in heaven? Nope. Tell me again why you're allowed in your house. Poverty allowed in heaven? Nope. Demons allowed in heaven? Nope. So, well, I don't have any demons in my house. Really? How long have you been under this delusion? Worry is a demonic demon. Anxiety, jealousy, envy. Here's a good one that's in the church. Are you ready? Offense. Unforgiveness. These are all demons. And they report to the demon general. What is the demon general? The spirit of fear. So make sure your house is clean of all these demons. Amen? That you can't be demon possessed because Jesus lives in you. But you surely can be demon oppressed. If there's fear in your house, there's a demon in your house. Are you getting a hold of this? Get rid of that demon. You have the authority and the power to bind that spirit of fear. Fear is not a feeling. Fear is a demonic spirit. Amen? That's why he says, I did not give you the spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit. Amen? All right. You are to bind and you loose what is loosed in heaven. What is loosed in heaven? Everybody shout angels. So who do I loose on earth now? Angels. But how do I loose angels? How do I bind demons? That's what we've been talking about. We're here to loose our angels. And we found out some things about our angels. Hmm. What did we find out? Let's go to Jeremiah 33, 22. Oh, I got an angel or two. Mm, no, you don't have an angel or two. You have a truckload more than that. As the host of the stars of the heavens. Who are the stars of the heavens? Angels. Revelations 1.20. He just put up there Revelations 1.20. We'll come back to this. I want you to see this. Revelations 1.20. Revelations 1.20 says this, As to the hidden meaning, the mystery of the seven stars. Huh. Uh, you saw on my right hand, and the seven lampstands of gold. The seven stars are seven what? Angels. So back in Jeremiah, what was he talking about? He was talking about the angels. Jeremiah 33.22. Back to Jeremiah 33.22. What are the stars? Angels. Here we go. As the host of the stars of the heavens, angels cannot be what? How many angels are there? Don't know. Why? Can't be numbered. If there's seven billion people on planet earth and everybody got one angel, that would be seven billion angels. The problem with that is seven billion is a number. What if each one of us was given a thousand angels? That would make it seven trillion. If there were seven trillion angels created by God, and we each got a thousand angels, guess what? That still wouldn't be enough. Why? Because that's a number. But the angels cannot be numbered. So let's just go with a thousand, just for the sake of example. What have you done with your thousand angels lately? Let's just say you only have a piddling thousand. Just, just, a, just, just a few following you around. A thousand angels. What are you using your angels to accomplish? What have you done with your thousand? And by the way, thousand can be measured. So my guess is you have more. Everybody say, I got more. How much more? I don't know. They can't be numbered. But let's just start with a thousand. What have you done with the first thousand angels God gave you? That's why we're having this conference. Without it, you cannot fulfill the plan of God for your life. Jesus couldn't do it without the angels. Uh, Paul couldn't do it without the angels. Peter couldn't do it without the angels. John couldn't do it without the angels. Neither can you. But you need to learn, how do I activate my angels? Hmm. Hebrews 12.22. Hebrews 12.22. We're learning about our angels. Hmm. Hebrews 12, 22. 
But rather you have come to Mount Zion, even to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the countless multitude of what? Angels. How many angels are there? I don't know. They count less. What does that mean? You can't even count them. One, two, three, four, blah, 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 one million, two million, three million, three, one trillion, one billion. You can't count them. That's how many angels there are. And he's released them on planet earth now under your care, under your direction. We've got to learn to activate those angels. Okay? Countless gathering of angels. Now, what do, well, let's go to our, our foundational scripture. There's 300 verses in the Bible on angels. How many? How can you not believe in angels? I'm going to show you some pictures of some angels. We just, we just, one of my friends just brought it in. Gilbert, thank you. We'll put that, we're going to put that up in the screen in a few minutes. But before we do that, let's go to Hebrews 1.14. Angels are real. They're bona fide. They're spirit beings. They've been released on planet earth. And they are under your direction. You've been given an army. A general doesn't fight battle. A general sends the soldiers out. So what have you done with your host of angels? Hmm. Are not angels all ministering spirits? That means they're all ministering spirits. What does that mean? They're all servants. They're to assist you. How do you know? Sent out in the service of God, of God, for what? See the rest of this? For the assistance of those who inherit salvation. Everybody shout, that's me. So they've been sent to take instructions from you to get God's kingdom on the earth. What instructions have you been giving your angels lately? Everybody shout, it's time. I'm going to go through real quick some of the stuff that the angels do. And you can write the reference down. In Matthew 4.11, angels met Jesus' physical needs. What does that mean? Bread and water. Food and something to drink. He was in the desert 39 days. On the 40th day, the devil came to tempt him. And when the je devil left, the angels immediately moved in and ministered to Jesus. When you've been not eating or drinking for 39 days, what do you think you would like to have now? Something to drink and something to eat. So when the angels ministered to Jesus, they brought him something to eat. I guess they were the original Uber. Come on now. <laughs> we're here. Oh, DoorDash. Here's your delivery. <laughs> so they, that's what they did. Now we go to another scripture. In Mark 1.13, they ministered to your physical needs. Oh, sorry, that was, we already did Mark 4.11, physical, Matthew 4.11, physical needs. Let's go to Luke 22.43, go over there, don't go over there. He, the angel was sent to strengthen Jesus. You ever gone through some kind of a trial or problem or situation where you felt weak? You can immediately call on your angels to strengthen you. Okay, that's what they did with Jesus. They strengthened Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. All right. In Acts 10.3, angels were sent to give direction to Cornelius. Cornelius' prayer, I want to know you better. And what did God do? God answered the prayer by, number one, sending an angel. What was the purpose of the angel? To instruct him to get a man by the name of Peter to come tell him about the gospel. Angels influence men to pour into your bosom. What else did we learn? Angels are your reapers. When was the last time you sent your reapers out to bring in your harvest? In Matthew 28, 2, angels were used because they had supernatural... St well, put down Matthew 28, 2. You've got to see this one. You have any idea how big your angels are and what they can do? Mm. Matthew 28, 2. <laughs> and behold, there was a great what? You know that angels can create an earthquake? Angels created the earthquake. That's how big your angels are. They probably jumped on earth and went, shoom, boom, an earthquake occurred. An angel can do that? Oh, yeah. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. One angel stepped on earth and it created an earthquake. Two angels. How many? 
two angels were sent to Sodom and Gomorrah, and two angels destroyed two cities. Have you any idea how powerful your angels are? You can use, they've been waiting on you. Your angels have been waiting on you. Let me show you how big your angels are. Can you find those boots? If you can find those boots, I want, to see, I want you to see the boots of my angels. You want to mess with me? I'm just going to show you the boots. After you see the boots, you ain't going to mess with me no more. These are just the boots of my angels. They're taller than Saks Fifth Avenue. And those are the boots, not the angels. Those are the boots. They couldn't be in this room. I'll tell you a little story. How many of you remember a gentleman by the name of Dr. Oral Roberts? Dr. Oral Roberts was on his deathbed. Okay? It's a true story. And his son, Richard, was in the room. As his dad was going out of the natural realm and into the spirit realm. And when his dad was passing into the spirit realm, two angels descended through the roof right there in that room. The angels were so big you couldn't see their shoulders or their head. It was above the ceiling. And those two, this is a true story. Those angels picked up the spirit of all Roberts and carried him up. Just left the body there, but took the spirit in heaven. And that's when uh, the Lord spoke to Richard Roberts and said, if you see your dad being taken to heaven, you can have double the anointing. Went to Kenya, and guess what? He had double the attendance for the crusades in Kenya, double the he healings, double the miracles. After that event. Man, I'm tingling all over. There's the anointing is coming down on this place. This is true. That's why you can't be thinking, I don't believe in angels. What's the matter with you? Need to get you saved again. Angels are real. <laughs> Amen. I use my angels every single day. So you've got to use your angels every day. Angels perform. What happened? There's an earthquake. Go back to that verse. Matthew 28, 2. An earthquake because an angel stepped on the earth. Hmm. Matthew 28, 2. A great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Everybody say, angels, angels. Are, spirit beings. are spirit beings. Could you put that picture up that we just got tonight? Hmm. They rolled back a boulder that four men couldn't move. One angel. Look up at the screen. When was this picture taken? 9-11. 9-11. Oh, that's just a cloud. What do you think a spirit being looks like? They don't have a physical body. They're a spirit being. Oh, I don't believe that's an angel. That's just a coincidence. Well, you can do that all you want. But you know what? There's a lot more people that have seen a lot more angels. His wife brought me a picture, and I don't even think we have that one. Do we have that one? I don't think I gave it to him. We have a, I'm going to make sure you get that picture so we can put that one on the screen. You have it? Oh, you have that picture? What's your cell number? Aaron? I'm not going to put it on Facebook. All right, send it to 918... <laughs> Hang on, hang on, hang on. Huh? 918. What's the rest of it, Aaron? We're going to send it to you right now. Send him that picture. You've got to start believing in angels. They are real. I have seen angels. We've, every time we go to the Holy Land, we see angels. Who came with me to the Holy Land before? Somebody, some of you lifted up your hand. Did you see angels when we were there? They saw angels singing with us in the pool of Bethesda in that church. It was incredible. If you get one of our flyers, I don't even know if I have it here. I'll pass it out to you. This is one of our flyers for the Holy Land. Look at this picture. We started singing here. Two minutes later, this is what the back 
look like. Same camera, same picture, same place, but you could see angels. Look at that second picture. Surrounded by angels. They love to worship God. They were singing with us. 5,000 angels. That's what it sounded like. I know. And there was only 23 of us. It sounded like there was a choir of 5,000 angels. See that? Passing it out. Angels are real. And they've been sent to you to fulfill your assignment. Amen. Did you send it to him? Okay, so he's going to get it in just a minute. So let's see if we can get that one up on the screen. Huh? What did he say? It's going to be a minute. Okay. All right, no problem. We'll keep talking <laughs> while that occurs. I'm trying to get you to get to the point where you finally realize that angels are real. And you use them every day for what you're supposed to use them. Every time we've gone to the Holy Land, every time people have seen angels. We were in a place called Megiddo. You remember Megiddo, Kelly? This is where Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to put his foot down. Right there. There are seven valleys around it. And guess what? Those valleys were filled with the armies of his enemies. And as I w looked up, I had a vision. And I turned around and I saw legions of angels all across the sky. And I thought, wow, maybe I'm just making this up. Three other guys saw exactly the same thing. Because we, we had dinner that night and three other people testified that they saw the legion of angels in the sky. They are real. Amen? All right. So, um... How did we get into this? Where were we? Anybody remember? Oh, the angels. You know what? Just to, give, just to give you a heads up. Remember Paul and Silas? They were in jail. And what occurred? An earthquake. How did that earthquake occur? An angel showed up. Remember Peter in prison? How did he get out of prison? An angel showed up. God used angels throughout the Bible to accomplish His will and His plan. We think, oh, I'm going to pray to God and God's going to do it. God's seated. He don't have to leave the throne. That's why He created countless army of angels. That's why Jesus called the Lord of hosts. What are these hosts? Hosts of angels. And they're not one army of angels, by the way. You'll find out. There's many armies of angels. Angels come in all different sizes. Some of them are chariots of fire. Some of them are like the wind, like the one we just saw. Like the wind. Like clouds. Oh, I don't believe in clouds. Well, you ain't never going to see Jesus then. <laughs> Why? Because God moves in a cloud. <laughs> He's got a cloud mobile. That's how he travels. <laughs> Read the Bible. God showed up. Where? In the cloud. Come on. <laughs> Get into the Word. Amen. You'll find that everything's in there. What else? Oh, there we go. I don't know if you can see it from here, but if you look over on this side, with, if those lights were off, you would see it. Just where my finger is pointing. Can you see it in the sky? There's an angel right there. With a sword. Oh, did angels have swords? Yeah, read the Bible. <laughs> angels had swords. And that angel is holding a sword. Oh, well, I don't know about... Well, come on now. Let the elevator go to the top. This is real. You can't take 299 verses out of the Bible and still call yourself a believer. Mm -mm. That can't happen. Everybody say, believers, believe. 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 Mm. What did we found out in Matthew 13, 39? Angels are our reapers. They bring in our harvest. They influence men to pour into our bosom the harvest of our seed. That's why they're called... Well, put it up there, Matthew 13, 39. Once you see this, I'm not making any of this stuff up. This is all in the Bible. The enemy who sowed it is the devil. The harvest is close and... The consummation of the age. That's, that means Jesus is going to come soon. And the reapers are who? Angels. Learn to use your angels. We found out that angels can cook. <laughs> they cooked for a prophet. Made him some food. Mm. 
We found out that uh, the disciples, the apostles needed angels to fulfill the plan. Angels, say this after me. Angels were sent to me to fulfill God's plan for my life. Hmm. Go to 2 Kings 6.17. Elisha, surrounded by the armies of his enemies... The servant Gehazi comes back and says, Hey, we're surrounded by the enemies. What are we going to do? Not once did Elisha pray. He just said, Open his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, looked out, he said, Wow, there's more for us than against us. Chariots of angels surrounding us. Did you know that the angels were always there? He hadn't opened his spiritual eyes to see them. The angels were always there. The angels stay with you because you love Jesus. The angels never leave you. Why do you think they're called watchmen? How can somebody watch you if they're in a different room? Every time you move to another room, the angels move with you. Wherever you go, the angels go there too. Because they are watching over you. What you pray, what you say, what you do. And they'll either move on your behalf or they won't move on your behalf, depending if what you say, pray, and do is based on God's Word. Are you seeing this? You start to activate your angels. Elisha prayed, I pray you open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Hmm. Who were these? The angels. So you can actually see angels when you're spiritual. And that's why I love going to the Holy Land. Because Holy Land is a portal from natural realm and the spirit realm. Everything that God did, you know He did that in the Holy Land? Created man, Holy Land. Garden of Eden, Holy Land. Adam, uh, Abraham I created uh, the animals in the Holy Land. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph lived where? The Holy Land. Where did they see the angels going up and down the ladder? The Holy Land. Because angels can come and they can go. They couldn't live here. They didn't have a permanent physical body. But they had enough to come, get, job, get the job done, and then leave. That's why there was a ladder going up and down, going in and out. Where was Jesus born? The Holy Land. Where was the Holy Spirit poured out? The Holy Land. Where did Jesus ascend to heaven from? The Holy Land. That's why in the Holy Land, your spiritual eyes come alive. You start to see things, hear things, and experience things that you can't hear anywhere else because it is a portal. Moses never made it to the Holy Land. You know that? Wrong. Because when Jesus went up to the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, guess who he bumped into? Moses. And that was in the Holy Land. Moses and Elisha, and they had lived hundreds of years apart, and yet they were there on top of that mountain. We went to the Mount of Transfiguration. We went to the top. We had experiences of, a coach who was here earlier uh, in the conference experienced seeing Moses and Elisha at the Mount of Transfiguration. Is all of this real? If it matches the Bible, it is. And it matches the Bible. Amen? We are spirit beings. It ought to be more natural for a spirit being to see in the spirit than to see with your natural eyes. That shouldn't be something strange. But we've been so conditioned to use only our five physical senses, we never develop our five spiritual senses. Jesus lived on the earth, but he walked in the spirit. How do you know? I only say what I see my father do. I only do what I see my father do. Only say what I hear my father say. When did he see that? God's the Spirit. So he must have been looking into the things of the Spirit. And you can do the same thing. Amen? Paul looked in the Spirit for... Ah, mm, oh, you're not ready for this yet. Are you sure? You sure? Okay. Don't get mad at me now. I'll find you the scripture because you know what? I'm a, ma I'm a, a stickler for the word. Mm -hmm. I think it was in the book of Ephesians. No. 
It was in Romans. Thank you, Lord. I'll show it to you. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're not. Ready. Maybe we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Romans chapter 8. Let's pick it up. <laughs> Let's pick it up in verse 3. Romans 8, verse 3. Hmm. For God has done what the law could not do, being weakened by the flesh, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit, sending His own Son in the guise of sinful flesh, and as an offering of sin, condemned sin in the flesh, subdued it, overcame it, deprived it of its power. Next verse. So that the righteous and the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled, met in us who live and move, not in the ways of the flesh. We live and move, what? Not in the ways of the flesh. How do we live and move? But in the ways of the Spirit. Our lives governed not by the standards and according to the effects of the flesh, but controlled by the Holy Spirit. Next verse. For those who are according to the flesh are controlled by its unholy desires. Set their minds on and pursue those things that gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit. Everybody say, that's me. What do we do? <laughs> and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit. Set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Spirit. You can set your mind on things of the Spirit. You can see things happening in another country. If you open your spiritual eyes, God can show you things because you're looking into the Spirit now. You're not looking into the flesh. You have spiritual eyes that can see. The eyes of your spirit are flooded with light. How? Through the Word. Because you have to set your mind on spiritual things, not on natural things. Paul wrote to the church, uh, and in the letter he says, about. let me tell you what's going on in that church. How did Paul know? He set his mind on spiritual things. And there's no distance in the spirit. Yes. You can actually see right there what's going on over there. Yes. In the spirit. Are you getting a hold of this? So it should be more natural that a spirit being should see in the spirit than just in the natural. Can I hear an amen? amen. Are you getting anything today? Yes. Mm. Okay. So we need to use our spiritual senses. We need to use our spiritual eyes. And we need to now use our angels. Protection comes. Let's go to Psalms 91. I want to make sure you get this. From this day forward, I don't want to hear about any more accidents. Uh-uh. You start using your angels now. So you have no more accidents. Amen? Everything's going to be okay. I have my angels protect my vehicle everywhere I drive. They protect the plane every time I fly. My plane is going to... That's why I tell the people sitting next to me, you might as well relax. We're going to arrive on time. How do you know? I got an angel over here and I got an angel over here on both wings. And every time we hit turbulence and the plane starts shaking like this, don't worry about it. Angels, I tell you right now, I'm trying to take some notes here. I'm preparing my sermon. Straighten out this plane right now. Straightens out. Every time. Every time. Why? Because I'm one of them crazy believing believers that when I instruct my angel, they actually do it. Come on. Listen, if you think you faced some problems on the airlines, how many problems do you think I've faced? I have five million miles on American. How many? Five million. So pretty much anything that could happen has happened to me. But I'm still here. None of my planes crashed. Are you getting a hold of this? And they think it was because of them. It was really because of my angels. I never leave home without them. Don't leave home without your angels. Everywhere I drive, always bring my angels. Ted, you've traveled with me to other churches. Always commission my angels to come with me everywhere I go. They not only, uh, not only protect my vehicle, not only make sure my vehicle is working right, but they also move traffic <laughs> out of the way for me and get me through construction quickly. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm very serious. 
I don't want to stand before Jesus and have him say, what did you do with that thousand angels I gave you? Right. Oh, I didn't even believe in them. Boy, that was a waste of angels. That was a waste of my angels on you. Should have given them to NASA. He would have used them. <laughs> if you don't want to use your thousand, give them to me. I'll, I'll use them. <laughs> I could use another thousand angels. Amen? I'll, I'm telling you, get your angels busy working. That's why you were given a thousand angels. Let's get them going. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, how do you see protection in your life? Uh, shall remain stable under the shadow of the Almighty. When you're under the shadow of the Almighty, nothing can touch you. How do you get under the shadow of the Almighty? Your angels put you there. They move that fortress and stick it right over you so nothing can touch you. How did it get there? Through your angels. Mm. I'll show you. Next verse. I will say of the Lord, how did I get there? My words moved my angels. Say this after me. My words, my words. Commissioned, commissioned my angels to put me under the shadow of the Almighty, under His fortress. And what happens when you're under His shadow? Keep reading. Mm. Next verse. Because you're there, your angels put you there, then, uh, then, when, then, once you've commissioned your angels, once they put you there, then He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the de deadly pestilence. No COVID can touch you under the shadow of the Almighty. That's why I tell people, you better hug me, because the anointing on me is going to kill the COVID on you. Hallelujah. Hang out with me. You're going to see that thing's going to die like that. Then he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you shall trust and find. Keep going. Refuge. The truth, his truth and faithfulness is like a shield and a buckler. Why? Because I'm under there. How would I get under there? My angels put me under there. Amen. Next verse. Verse 6. Oh, verse 5. You shall not be afraid. Everybody shout, no more fear. No, I'm not going to live in fear of COVID. I'm not going to live in fear of pandemics. I'm not going to live in fear of lack. I'm not going to live in fear, period. Because God did not give me a spirit of? Fear. So it wasn't from God, so why am I going to accept it? He gave me angels, but not fear. So I will not be afraid. doesn't matter what the media is saying. doesn't matter what the news is saying. I will not be afraid, Period. I will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow or the evil plots. Keep going. Uh huh. And the slanders of the wicked. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what they say about me. Can't, it can't touch me. Why? I won't let it touch me. No fear here. Next verse. What's this got to do with angels? Nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction of sudden death that surprise and lay waste in noonday. Next, next verse. A thousand may fall. At my side, 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. Why? Because I'm under the shadow of the Almighty. I'm under His fortress. How did I get under there? The angels put me under there. How do you know? Watch this. Next verse. Only a spectator will I be. I travel all over the world. I meet people all the time. And they told me, now watch this. They told me, I don't buy this, they told me because two years ago I was paralyzed and a stroke in, in St. Francis Hospital at Yale and 61st, this side of my body totally paralyzed. And they said I wouldn't walk again. Well, guess what? I'm walking, I'm preaching, I'm traveling all over the world. And they said, you have a pre-existing condition. I said, yeah, I know. His name is the Holy Spirit. You may get COVID any day now. I said, try it. You'll see. That COVID thing will die. Can't touch this body. Because I got the anointing that destroys every yoke. Are you getting a hold of this? No fear here. Say this after me. Faith, Faith. Opens, the door opens the door for the blessings of God. Blessings of God. Fear, fear opens the door, opens the door. for the attack of the enemy. Can I show you a scripture that's really going to settle this so you'll never get into fear again? We'll come back to this verse in just a minute. Go to Job 3.25. Job 3.25. You're going to love this. Job 3.25. Hmm. The thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. 
Say this after me. Fear, Fear attracts, attracts what you're afraid of. You want COVID-19? Just go ahead and get fearful. Let it come on you. I don't want COVID-19. Then stop being afraid of it. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. You with me? What I feared has come upon me. Uh-uh. Not what, I, not what I prayed for the blessing. No, what I feared shoo, took control. No more. Go back to Psalms 91.8. This is where we were. Are you getting something tonight? Yes. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's just getting started. <laughs> Verse 9. Uh -huh. Only a spectator shall you be yourself inaccessible. Can't touch me. I'm inaccessible. Why am I inaccessible? Because I'm in the secret place of the Most High. How'd I get there? My angels put me there. How do you know your angels put you there? Keep going. We'll see the rest of this. Secret place of the Most High. As you witness the reward of the wicked. I'm just going to be a spectator. I'm going to watch this happen to other people. Can't happen to me. I'm just a spectator. Next verse. Verse 9. Because. Why can it not happen to me? Because. Because of what? You have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your dwelling place. Everybody say, comma. comma. So don't stop reading. Jump into the next verse. Keep reading. There shall no evil befall you, nor any plague or calamity come near your tent. I made that refuge my dwelling place. How do I do that? For He will give His angels charge over you to accompany you. Who put me in the secret place? The angels. Who put me under the protection? The angels. Who's going to defend me against anything that's trying to attack me? The angels. He's given charge to His angels, a special charge over you to accompany and defend. Let's keep going. And preserve you in all of your ways. That's why nothing can touch me. Because I got the angels. And they put me in the secret place through my words. I will say, what have you been saying? Though I say that everywhere I go, when I travel, those angels are with me. And guess what? They are. They protect me. Th this is a true story. This happened to me a couple of times. Mm. Let me tell you the first story. I landed in Houston. Late. The plane was delayed. I had to make a connecting flight. They need 30 minutes to board the baggage. This was before, they, before the cutoff of 10 minutes. I had seven minutes. I ran, because we arrived late, ran to my gate. They were just closing the door as I jumped in. They opened the door, I jumped in. There is no human possibility, because uh, it was on the other side of the terminal, that my baggage would make it. Not humanly possible. I said, angels, get my bag on this plane. We landed in Richmond, Virginia. They unloaded my two suitcases. How did those suitcases get on that plane? That was physically impossible. But they were there. Come on now. I was running late for a meeting. They actually ha they had to take me from the airport directly to the pulpit. They were already in praise and worship when my plane landed. Because we the plane was running late because of, uh, uh, I don't know, the, some mechanical thing. So guess what? I commissioned my angels. I said, angels, get behind this plane. Get the wind pushing this plane. I don't want a headwind. I want a tailwind. Next thing you know, shh, we catch up time. How do we do that? Now watch this, watch this. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you because you can check this out with aviation. Sun rises from the east and sets in the west. Wind blows from the west to the east. Got it? Mm -hmm. So what that means is because it's coming from the west, when you're going west, you're hitting a headwind. When you're going east, you're hitting a tailwind. We were going west. And the headwind turned into a tailwind. And pushed us there faster. Yeah. How? Now, what am I going to do? I'm going to tell the pilot, hey, you know, give me a pat on the back. It was my angels. <laughs> he ain't going to believe a word of it. But it's true. I'm a man of God. I'm not going to lie to you. 
because I use my angels everywhere I go. The plane that you're supposed to connect comes up on the screen. It's been delayed arriving here. Oh, really? Hmm. Well, we're going to fix that. I send my angel. Get it in quick. I need to go. All of a sudden they say, oh, it's only been delayed five minutes now, not 35 minutes. You know the biggest problem? Well, I'll tell you. The biggest problem I have in Tulsa, can I tell you, if you've done any flying or you know anything about aviation, you'll understand what I'm about to say. You can't pretty well go anywhere uh, uh, that you want to go around the world from Tulsa. You've got to go to Dallas. Dallas, you get all your connecting flights. Here's the problem. If Dallas is having bad weather, right, they delay flights from taking off. Which ones? The ones closest to Dallas. You talk to anyone in aviation, they'll tell you that's exactly what they do. So you have no idea how many times I got on a plane in Tulsa going to Dallas and we went down the runway and we parked. You don't park on a runway. Yes, you do. We've been told by the tower to park on the side. Why? Because there's bad weather and there's delaying flights to get to Dallas because other planes have to land and other planes have to take off. And we are part of that group that has to be delayed because we're so close. So I'm thinking, oh, I got a, I got a connecting flight to make. <laughs> I send my angels. Angels, go. Fix this problem right now. Get those other planes landing quick and the other ones taking off. They said there'll be an hour delay before we take off. Oh, the captain comes on and says, 20 minutes. They've said we can fly. It was my angels that did that. If you're ever on a plane with me, you can come thank me. My angels got me taken off and getting there faster. Don't tell me it don't happen. I already told you testimonies of uh, how... A, 40-foot tractor trailer was coming straight at my car because we'd hit black ice. And then I just cried Jesus because Jesus is the Word. So when you say the name of Jesus, guess what you're speaking? The Word. And the next thing you know, my car was sitting on the side of the road and the tractor trailer had gone straight past and he was coming straight at me. How did that happen? My angels. Stop leaving home without your angels. They are there to preserve you. They are there to protect you. They are there to strengthen you. They are there to give you uh, whatever needs you have to fulfill God's plan for your life. Are you getting a hold of this? We, everybody say, we need our angels. And we learned yesterday that the fallen, the, the demons are fallen angels. We learned that through the scriptures yesterday, so I'm not going to go back there. Angels love to worship God, so we need to worship God. We've got to avoid all this flakiness about these little baby angels. There ain't no baby angels. By the way, let me just say this. Angels are spirit beings. That means they don't have a gender. But they are usually referred to in the male species. Are they male? They don't have a gender. They're spirit beings. But there's no female angels out there. And angels cannot reproduce. And angels don't grow up. When they're made, they're made finished. You getting a hold of this? And angels do not know when Jesus is going to come back. So if you heard a voice saying that Jesus is going to come back July 1st, 2021, that was a demon spirit. <laughs> Nobody knows but the Father. Got it? Remember I told you about the book that was written? Jesus coming back in 1988. Sold millions of copies. Jesus didn't come back. Wrote another book. Jesus coming back in 1999. No. Nobody knows. So don't get moved with all this flakiness that's out there. Everybody say, stay with the Word. Stay with the Word. Stay with the word. Always stay with the Word. Amen. Come with me to 1 Peter 1.12. Angels are not commissioned by God to bring the gospel. They don't understand the gospel. They don't know what it is. They have no knowledge of the gospel. They love to sit in teachings like this so they can learn the word. They don't know that. They have no clue. They don't have any, any understanding of, of, of your spirit man dying. They have no understanding of that. 
They have no understanding that the blood would replenish and put you back, wash you clean of sin. They have no understanding of that. But they can follow an instruction to put somebody in front of you that will give you that information. Just like the angel after the huge crusade in Samaria. The whole city rejoiced. The angel showed up and said, Philip, now you're finished over here. Come with me. We're going down this road. I got you on the second assignment. You're supposed to meet this eunuch. You're supposed to tell him about the gospel. Guess what? That eunuch went back to Ethiopia. And all the Jews in Ethiopia gave their lives to Christ. How do you know? Because in 1947, they moved to Israel. Couldn't figure out why the other Jews were not serving Jesus. How? Because one angel appeared to one lame guy called Philip and put him in front of the person that was going to bring the gospel. So angels will help you get in front of people that need to hear the word. Everybody say, they hear the word. Hear the word. Hmm. Acts 12, 21. Acts 12, 21. We already covered the scripture on Haman. How many angels are there? Millions. Countless. <laughs> Innumerable. That's why if you have only a thousand, that's still a number. Maybe I have 10,000. Wow. What can we do with 10,000 angels that are so big that they just stomp on the ground and an earthquake occurs and they're waiting on my instruction because I am seated in the center of of all authority and power. You getting a hold of this? On an appointed day, Herod arrayed himself uh, in royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and addressed an oration to the people. Next verse. And the assembly people shouted, It is the voice of a God. Don't you dare touch the glory. Don't you dare get out of pride. I'm a God. Oh, really? You know what happens when you touch the glory? An angel shows up. And it ain't good. Read the next verse. <laughs> at once. Everybody say, at once. at once. I think I was at the tape table a little earlier, and Sherry said, oh, I enjoyed the message this morning. It was really good. First words that came out of my mouth, glory to God. I don't want to touch the glory. I couldn't do anything without Him. It's His glory, not my glory. Uh -uh, I'm not going to take any accolades. I'm just a vessel. You say, but look at what I did. No, you spoke a word. The donkey spoke a word. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're right there with the donkey. <laughs> Stay out of pride. Amen. What happened to this guy? The angel smote him, cut him down, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms. I don't want to be eaten that way. Uh. <laughs> not good. Everybody say, not good. not good. Don't you touch God's glory. Uh-uh. How do you loose angels? By your decrees. How do you bind demons? By your decrees. Amen? So you better be born again. Look at Acts 19. If you're not born again, you're in serious trouble. Don't bother binding nothing. Don't bother loosing nothing. Because if you're not born again, it ain't going to work for you. Here we see now, where did I ask you to go? Acts 19. Acts 19, what verse? Anybody remember? 13. Acts 19, 13. Then some of the traveling Jewish exorcists. Everybody say Jewish. Jewish. They weren't Christians. They weren't born again. They were Jewish. Hmm. What were they doing? They were trying to uh, get this evil spirit to leave. Also undertook to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Because they saw Paul using the name Jesus and evil spirits running. So they said, we'll use that name. Jesus is not a lucky charm. It's not a name that you use once in a while. Uh-uh. And look at what they, they tried to do that saying, I implore you and charge you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Look out. They weren't saved. You know what happens when you bind something and you're not saved? Read the next verse. Seven sons of a certain Jewish chief priest. Everybody say Jewish. Jewish. Mm -hmm. Named Sceva were doing this. Seven sons. Seven grown men. Seven grown men were doing this. Next verse. One evil spirit. Everybody say one. 
Not seven evil spirits. One. One evil spirit says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who the heck are you? You're trying to use the name of Jesus. You're not saved. He ain't living in you. So here's what I'm going to do. Just for you. Next verse. The man in whom the evil spirit dwelt. Everybody say, Amen. Amen. Beat up seven men. Leapt on them. Mastered two of them. And was so violent against them that they dashed out of the house in fear. Stripped naked and wounded. Don't you be messing with demons if you're not saved. (laughs) They'll beat you up. (laughs) But if you're saved. And by the way, you don't have to fight a demon. The Bible never says fight a demon. You know what the Bible says? Resist. Resist means... Can I tell you what the walk of faith is? Are you ready? So simple. Say this after me. The walk of faith faith has no no moving moving parts. parts. When you've done all, what do I do? Stand. There's no moving parts. I ain't moving. When you become immovable... Mountains will move. But if you are movable, mountains will never move. So what you got to do is resist. Devil comes, you say, no. No, I know who I am. I ain't moving. I'm not fighting you. Because I know who I am. And the moment you make those words, guess what? The Bible says resist and the devil will what? Flee. You know what the word flee means in the Greek? Run in terror. Just because you know who you are. The sons of Sceva did not know who they were. They were trying to use a lucky na, a name. Didn't work. So if you're going to bind and loose, you better be saved. Amen? Everybody shout, I'm saved. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. We found out that the the angel... mm. Say this after me. The angel of light or the angel of the Lord is Jesus. Now, I don't have time to go through all the scriptures. I've got a ton of scriptures. We'll just have to do that another day. But I do want to read something for you that will help you. Okay, here we go. The angel of the Lord or of God, the angel of God or the angel of light or the angel of his presence is readily identified with the Lord God. In Genesis, and it goes through many scriptures in Genesis, Exodus, and other passages, but it is obvious that the angel of the Lord is a distinct person in himself from God the Father. explains that in Genesis and in Exodus and Zechariah and in other passages. Nor does the angel of the Lord appear again after Christ came in human form. Hmm. He must of necessity be one of the three in one Godhead. The angel of the Lord is the visible Lord God in the Old Testament as Jesus Christ is in the New Testament. So when you see the Lord of hosts, that's Jesus showing up as the angel of the Lord, angel of light. That's why you see all the time it's referred to with a capital A. Everybody say capital A. Is Jesus himself showing up. Amen? Now, let me, let me go. The Lord of hosts. That means there's got to be some hosts. What are the hosts? Armies of angels. Armies. Everybody say armies. armies. Not one army. Armies of angels. Angels are agents of God. God speaks and the angels carry it out. I've been praying. Yeah, but you don't understand. God don't leave the throne. He's quite comfortable right there. But how do I get my answers? He uses his armies of what? Angels. He did that all throughout the Old Testament. And he's doing that now. The battle is who? The Lord's. Who was fighting the battle? The angels. Not God himself. You are a king that he is the king of. What have you been using your army of angels for? You don't have to fight nobody. You've got angels to take care of that. God speaks and the angels carry it out. Psalms 103.20. What carries it out? When you give God's word voice. Psalms 103.20. Bless the Lord, you his what? Angels. Who do what? They hearken. Hearken to what? The voice. The voice of what? His word. You speak his word. See, see, 
You speak Chinese. What do you, do you speak Mandarin or what do you speak? Mandarin and Cantonese. So if I spoke in Cantonese, she could hear me. If I spoke in Mandarin, she would understand me. If I spoke in French, she probably wouldn't. So as long as you're speaking a language other than the language the angels speak. Help me, angels! Go get this, angels! <laughs> you're in trouble. They don't even understand you. Because they only understand the voice of what? The Word. So the only thing you can give voice to is the Word. The only thing they hear is the Word. The only thing they understand is the Word. The word. So you better know the Word. You better get back into this book. I got this army of angels. I don't know how to instruct them. Get back in the book. Learn the Word. Because they obey the voice, which is your voice, on His Word. Everybody with me so far? So important that you know that. Yeah, you want me to do that, Lord? Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Ooh, okay. Hmm. Uh, there was a man whose heart was failing. He prayed and sent his angels out in hospital. Woke up the next morning in hospital. Are you ready? He had a new heart. There was a man in Africa. He had a metal bar in his arm. Prayed for his angels to fix that. Woke up in the morning. The metal bar was lying next to his bed. The angels had already changed it and put a brand new elbow in there in the middle of the night. These are true stories. Time for you and I to use our angels. Can I hear an amen? amen? Come on, it's time. But now, here's the part I wanted to get to. Hmm. 1 Corinthians. No, 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 no. How do I do this, Lord? Okay. Everybody say, angels, angels. Only, obey only obey the word of God. The word of God. So I'm going to give you one side of the angels you have never heard before. Are you ready? Okay. You sure? Yeah. All right. Let's go to Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28. A misquoted scripture by many churches, but we're going to look at it in context, right? Well, it's Romans 8.28. Mm. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor. Everybody say, how is, a part how is God a partner? Through His angels. Hmm. In their labor, all things work together and are fitting for good to those who love God and are called according to His design and purpose. How many of you believe you're called according to God's design and purpose? How many of you want all things to work together for you? How many sometimes all things didn't work together? Don't lie. Why? Because this scripture was pulled out of context. You want to find out how to get all things working together? Back up two verses. Verse 26. Romans 8.26. So too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. Everybody say weakness. weakness. Physical weakness? No. Spiritual weakness? No. What weakness are we talking about? For we do not know what prayer to offer nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. Everybody say prayer weakness. Prayer. What kind of weakness? Prayer. prayer weakness. So you have a prayer ministry. So you need to find out what is a prayer weakness. Because there is such a thing as a prayer weakness. Number one. Number two, there's a way that you prayer that works and a prayer that doesn't work. If you know how to offer it as you ought, then you surely can offer it as you ought not. If you know how to offer it worthily, surely you can offer it unworthily. So what is this weakness? Here we go. We don't know what kind of prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit Himself goes to meet our supplication. That's our prayer. And pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. What is this? Oh, yearnings and groanings. What is this? What's He talking about here? 
Back up. Go to the next. Sorry. Go to the next verse. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to the harmony and the will of God. What are these yearnings? What are these sounds? It is your heavenly language. Yeah, but it says the Spirit does it. Stop. Go to Acts 2, verse 1. How does the Spirit do it? Let's find out. Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled in one place. 120 men plus women and children. The place was packed. Next verse. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing violent tempest, like a sonic boom. Why was there a sonic boom when they got filled with the Holy Ghost? But there's no sonic boom now. Because when that sonic boom occurred, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, at the same time, I changed my number now. Seven trillion angels were released. That'll create a sonic boom. Hmm. Uh huh. And the, it filled the whole house in which they were sitting. Next verse. And there appeared to them tongues resembling fire. Somebody got hot, and which was separated and distributed and settled on each one of them. Next verse. Verse 4. And they were all filled with what? The Holy Spirit. And what was the end result of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Uh huh. And began to speak in other tongues. How? As the Spirit kept giving them expression or utterance. As the Spirit kept giving them their spiritual language. The Spirit gives you your spiritual language. Got it? How does the Spirit give you your spiritual language? You hear. In here, syllables. And you speak those syllables. You utter what you hear. When I first got filled with the Holy Ghost, I got one syllable. One. Ba, ba, ba. Everywhere I would go, I'd go, ba, 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 ba. I, I look so foolish in church. Everybody else is praying in a whole tongue language, and I'm going, ba, 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 ba. That's all I got. But you know what? If you will do what you got... It will grow. Yes. One day I'm driving down the street going, ba, 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 shara mesiki tiro kotoro oro ma, 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 asakati. And the language exploded. Yeah. What was that? It was a spiritual tongue language given to me. Why is this so crazy? God's a spirit. If God was Chinese and you were Chinese, what language would you speak? Chinese. If God was Spanish and you were Spanish, what language would you speak? Spanish. If God was French and you were French, what language would you speak? French, if God's a spirit and you are a spirit, why are you surprised that where's a spiritual language? Yeah. To me, that's common sense. We got a spiritual language to speak to a spirit God. It's that simple. But how did we get the language? The Holy Spirit gave us syllables. And we uttered those syllables. How did He give those syllables to you? Because that's what you heard on the inside. And you repeated it. And what you heard on the inside, you started mouthing it. You started to speak it. And your language started to grow. Everybody with me so far? Everybody say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gave, me gave me my spiritual language, my spiritual language through, utterance. through utterance. Okay, now you heavy for the revelation? Say this after me. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaks, in tongues. speaks in tongues. John 16, 13. Watch this. We're again going somewhere with this. John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak of His own message, of His own authority. Uh Uh-uh. But He will tell you whatever He hears from who? The Father. So where did the Holy Spirit get your tongue language from? The Father. Hmm. So the Father gave your tongue language to who? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came and gave it to you. So now you got your tongue language. Say this after me. The Holy Spirit Spirit speaks in tongues. tongues. The Father Father speaks in tongues. tongues. 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going somewhere with this. Okay. 1 Corinthians. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 14.1. 
1 Corinthians 14.1. Eagerly pursue and seek love. Make it your greatest quest. Earnestly design, cultivate spiritual endowments, especially that you may prophesy. Mm. Divine uh, will, the interpretation, the divine will, and the purpose inspired by teaching and preaching. Next verse. For one who speaks in an unknown tongue, huh, speaks not to men. So if you understand what you're saying, I don't understand, that sounds like gibberish, you're on the right track. I don't understand what I just said. Good. You're not supposed to understand. Why? Because you're not speaking to men. Who are you speaking to? God. Now why would God give you a language he don't understand? So if God gave you a spiritual language, he understands it. You with me so far? So you got it? God gave your language to who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave it to who? You. Because he only speaks what he hears from the Father. Got it? So therefore, when I speak in tongues, where did my tongue language come from? The Father. What's this got to do with anything? Jeremiah 1.12. Now we'll put, it, we'll put it together and you'll see why it's so important. Jeremiah 1.12. Then says the Lord to me, you have seen well, for I, I, God, I, Lord, am alert, active, and watching what? My word to perform it. Got it? Let me borrow your Bible. Everybody say, this Bible is God's written word. But when I speak in tongues, is God's spoken word. Because it came from God. So if God watches over this to perform it, don't you think He watches over tongues to perform it? The rules that apply to this word apply to tongue language. Are you getting a hold of this? Because it's the Word of God. Everybody say the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 13.1 Just grab a seat right there, please. 1 Corinthians 13.1 Let's, let's, let's get, keep going. If I speak in tongues of men and even of angels. Uh-oh. Everybody say angels. Hmm. Angels. Everybody say angels understands tongues. Angels understand tongues. So what does that mean? Angels hearken to what? The voice of what? God's word. But what is God's word? Two groups of words. Logos, written word. Rhema, spoken word. When you speak in tongues, you're actually speaking rhema. Why? It came from the Father. If it came from God and He spoke it first, guess what? It is the Word of God. Are you getting a hold of this? It's the Word of God. So when I speak in tongues, guess what? I'm giving voice to God's Word. What does that mean? The angels start moving. When? When I speak in tongues. Are you getting a hold of this? When I give God's written Word voice, angels move. When I give tongues voice, the angels move. I got this revelation. It's like, okay. I'm not sure what to do in this situation. My angels are going, yes sir, we got it. We'll take care of it. Amen. Got it? Amen. So I said, I probably never heard this before. God gave me this. I said, okay, Lord, tongues of men and tongues of angels. That's what we need now in this day and age. Amen? Amen. God is so awesome. Okay. Got so much word and so little time. Come on. Everybody say, angels, angels. love to worship God. Where is that scripture on worship? I want to give you the scripture so you understand. Angels love to worship God. Go with me to Hebrews 1, 6 and 7. Hebrews 1, 6 and 7. Hebrews, moreover, when he brings the firstborn son again into the habitable world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Everybody say, the angels love worship. 
Here we go. John 20, verse 1. John 20, verse 1. This story is an incredible story. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. Who is Mary Magdalene? The one that had those demons cast out of her. That's Mary Magdalene following Jesus. Right? Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. How early? It's still dark. Now, you know what? I wish I had time to teach you all of this, so take my word for it. Jesus was on the cross, but not in the old city. It was outside of the old city. It was in a place called Golgotha. You ever heard that before? Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there by the main road, that's when they would crucify people on the cross. Why? So everybody could see as they were entering the city, that's what happens if you disobey. And that's where the three crosses were. And the people were being crucified. And Jesus was there. It was outside of the gates of the city. Outside of the gates of the city was a dangerous place. There were wild animals. There were robbers and thieves and killers out there. And it was still dark. Why would a woman by herself get up in the middle of the night? Why would she go outside the protection of the city gates to go look at a tomb? Why would she do that? Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it is still dark. Hmm. And saw that the stone had been removed. The angel had moved that stone out. Remember? We saw that. An earthquake. Boom. There goes the stone. Hmm. Removed. Lifted out of the groove across the entrance of the tomb. Next verse. So she ran. She didn't go inside. She just saw the stone in front of the tomb removed. So what was her response? Wow, what's going on here? She ran back in the dark, back through the gates, ran back and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, who was John, by the way, whom Jesus tenderly loved. Did you notice John wrote that? (laughs) Who Jesus tenderly loved. Okay, got it. And said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. She was so hungry to see even a dead Jesus that she left in the middle of the night to go there to be with her Lord and Savior. Even though he was dead, she had to be with him. It was empty. She came back and said, they've taken him. Hmm. Upon this, Peter and the other disciple, John, came out and they went towards the tomb. So they came with her now. They're running back to the tomb to find out what's going on. Hmm. And they came running together. But the other disciple, everybody say John, outran Peter. Hmm. For some reason, John thinks it's important for you to know that. (laughs) Outran Peter. Come on now. And arrived at the tomb first. Who got there first? John. Who's telling the story? John. (laughs) Next verse. And stooping down. Those of you that have been with, with me to the Holy Land, you know what I'm talking about. You have to stoop down to go inside that tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not enter. Next verse. Then Simon Peter... He was a little bit slower than John. He finally caught up. He gets there, following him, and went into the tomb. Now, did you notice that John, oh yeah, he ran faster, but he wouldn't go in. (laughs) He forgot to mention that part. But Peter went in. Remember Peter, big mouth Peter? He's the one that's always saying things, always doing things. He was bold. He went in there. Hmm. Simon Peter came up following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. Next verse. But the burial napkin, which had been around Jesus' head, was not lying with the other linen cloths, but was still rolled up and wrapped around in a place by itself. Next verse. Then the other disciple. Which one? John. Come on now. (laughs) Who had reached the tomb first. 
just in case you forgot the first previous verse, he's going to tell you again. He's the one that got there first. I got there first. Mm. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went in too. <laughs> Finally decided to enter, huh? After Peter's already been in there. And he saw that and was convinced and believed. Next verse. For as they, uh, yet they did not know and understand the statement of the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now they didn't understand that. Next verse. Then the disciples, the disciples did what? Went back again to their homes. Went back. The tomb's empty. Jesus gone. The cross lying there. Napkins lying there. He ain't here. How did they respond? They went back home. Well, we tried. We tried. Nothing happened. He's not here. So we might as well go home. Hmm. Mary didn't go home. Uh uh. No, no, no. I want to be with my Jesus. I ain't leaving here. Period. And she started weeping. Where is my Jesus? Wouldn't it be awesome if the church ever got so hungry for Jesus that we started weeping just to be in his presence? Wouldn't it be good for the church to get that kind of hunger? I'm not leaving. I got to be with Jesus. And she started crying because she wanted to be with her Jesus. As she wept, as she what? Wept. She stooped down and looked into the tomb. Hmm. Next verse. And she saw how many angels? Peter didn't see no angels. Or the one that ran faster than him. Because <laughs> they were concerned to look at a physical body. They were not concerned about worshiping Jesus. She came to worship Jesus. They came to see an empty tomb. Are you getting a hold of this? One was looking for the supernatural. The other one was just looking to worship. And the one that was looking to worship saw the supernatural. And the ones that were looking for the supernatural saw nothing. The angels were always there. But she saw the angels in white, sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Next verse. And they said to her, Woman, why are you sobbing? She told them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She wanted to be with him so bad. Wherever they've laid him, I just want to go there. I want to get on my knees. I just want to worship. That's all I want to do. I just want to be with him. I know he's dead, but I want to be with him. On saying this, she turned around and saw who? Jesus. Standing there. But she did not know or recognize. Why didn't she recognize him? He wasn't. That's not what she saw. He wasn't the one she had seen on the cross. This was the risen Lord. That's why she didn't recognize him. Watch this. Hmm. Next verse. Verse 15. She didn't recognize it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying so? So now Jesus is speaking. For whom are you looking? Supposing it was a gardener. First of all, where was Jesus? Everybody say, behind her. Behind her. That's why she had to look back to see Jesus. She had to turn around. The angels were in the tomb. Jesus wasn't in the tomb. He was walking the garden behind her. Got it? Hmm. Jesus said, woman, why are you crying so? For whom are you looking? Supposing that it was the gardener. She replied, if you have carried him away from here, tell me where have you put him? And I will take him away. I just got to be next to my Jesus. Got to be close to my Jesus. Jesus said to her, Mary. You see the exclamation mark? Mary, don't you know who's here? Don't you know who I am? Mary. Turning around. Ah, so now she's finally looking at who's talking to her. Turning around, she said to him in Hebrew. Next verse. 
Rabboni, which means teacher or master. Next verse. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Now listen to this. You've got to get this. This was the greatest journey that Jesus was on. He had just left down there. He'd stripped the devil, made a show of him openly. He'd shed his blood for the salvation of all mankind. The blood that paid for the sin of all mankind. And he had with him the blood. And he was on his way to the throne room to put the blood on the mercy seat. And as he was taking the blood to the mercy seat, he got interrupted by a woman who would want just to worship him. And he stopped in the m middle of the very journey he came to do, which was put the blood on the mercy seat. In the middle of that journey, he stopped because worship drew him to her presence. And he said, don't touch me. You can't touch me yet. I'm still carrying the blood. Tell them I'm, I'm alive and well. In the middle of that greatest journey, he got sidetracked by somebody who would not leave without worshiping him. Oh, that the church would get such a hunger to be with Jesus. Oh, that we would get there. And you know, you know what? She ran in the dark with animals and robbers just to worship Jesus. Where have you laid him? i got to be with my Jesus. And now the veil is rent. That veil that was between the holy place and the holy of holies was 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, 5 feet deep. That's how thick that curtain was. And it ripped from top to bottom. All 60 feet ripped when he was on the cross. And God says, now come boldly to the throne room. Come and worship me. God has time for us. You know what the shame is? We don't have time for him. We don't have to go in the dark. We don't have to fight wild animals. We don't have to put our life on the line. We can worship Him in our living room. But we don't. Because we don't have time. Worshiping God is not a priority in our life. But tonight, we're going to worship God. Tonight, we're going to enter the Holy of Holies. Because when you enter the Holy of Holies, two things happen. When she started to worship God, did you notice? She saw angels. Who saw angels? She did. What about Peter and the guy that ran faster than him? They didn't see angels because they were not interested in worship. You want to see some angels? Start to worship God. They always appear when you worship God. Angels love to worship God. They were created to worship God. All the time they're around the throne room going, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and will be forevermore. Tonight when we worship God, I'm saying this under the unction of the Holy Ghost, some of you tonight, tonight, if you will stay for the worship, you will see angels. How many of you want to see some angels? Because your spiritual eyes will open up tonight. You can't speak about something and the anointing is not there. I can't speak about salvation and the anointing to get saved is not there. You can't teach on healing and the anointing to heal is not there. But we've been teaching on angels for three days. You know those angels are right here. They're going to worship God when we worship God. Isn't Jesus wonderful? We're going to do that in just a minute. But before we take our nightly offering, I want you to go to mm, two scriptures. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. There's two things God told me to pray about for you tonight. Two. 
Number one, Second Kings chapter 4, verse 1. The wife of the son of the prophets cried to Elisha. Now, let's see, get this right. Wife of the son. The wife of the son. Watch this now. Of the prophets. So we got Elisha. Then below him we've got what? Prophets. Below him we got what? The son. Below, next to him is what? The wife. Everybody with me so far? Elisha, prophets, son of a prophet, wife. She came to him. Hmm. Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know your servant feared the Lord. But the creditors have come to take my two sons to be his slaves. Wow. I don't know what trouble you've been in. But when was the last time somebody said, I'm taking your kids away? Some of you, that might be a day of rejoicing. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you got in the house? And your handmaiden said, I got nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. What did she call nothing? A jar of oil. What did God call the jar of oil? Seed. I ain't got nothing. No, no, no. To God, it's seed. God has, says it's something. What are we going to do with this jar of oil? Uh-huh. Accept a jar of oil. That's all I got. Next verse. Then he said, go around and borrow vessels from all your neighbors. Empty vessels and not a few. You know what vessels the neighbors had? Can I tell you? They were this high. And they were vessels of water. Every home had them. Why? Because when you walked to place to place, your feet got dirty with the sandals. So every home you entered, the first thing you had to do is wash your feet with that water. And that's why they all had vessels. Remember in the, the wedding at Cana? What did Jesus say? Go find those empty vessels. Fill them with water. And he turned it into wine. Remember that? That's why they had vessels. They, oh, they contained 30 gallons of water. Each vessel. 30 gallons. Go get those vessels. Borrow those vessels from your neighbors. And not a few. You're about to go into the oil business. You're about to become the richest woman right here in the Middle East. Here's what we're going to do. Go borrow them. And he said, not a few. If you knew you were going to get a hundredfold on your seed, would you sow a dollar? Are you crazy? So I could get a hundred dollars back? No way. I'd sow a thousand. So I could get a hundred thousand back. No, no. I'd sow ten thousand. So I could get a million back. Not a few. The same anointing is going to hit it. The same anointing is going to turn it into a hundredfold. What would you sow if you knew the same anointing was going to hit it? You wouldn't sow a few. Got it? Imagine if she only got three vessels. She would have had three vessels of oil. What if she got 300 vessels? She would have 300 vessels of oil. What if she went into the vessel making business? Are you getting a hold of this? Then when you come in, shut the door because you're about to see a miracle. Upon you and your sons, then pour out, pour out the jar, the jar, the jar. Everybody say the jar. The jar. So she poured it into that 30 gallon vessel. It got full of oil. This jar. And she looked at her jar. And it was still full of oil. So she poured it again. The vessel got full. She looked at her jar. Still full of oil. She went down the line and kept pouring. And pouring and pouring. Every jar got full of oil. She looked at her hand. Still that jar has got oil. It's not running out. Hmm. Setting aside each one when it is full. Everybody say full. full. Next verse. So she went from him and shut the door upon herself and her son brought in the vessels and she poured the oil. Next verse. She kept pouring because the jar was full. When the vessels were all full, she said, bring me another one. Now why would you ask someone to bring you another one if your jar is empty? Ah, so the jar wasn't empty, was it? Bring me another vessel. I'm going to fill it. Hmm. That was still here. And he, keep reading, verse 6, said to her, there is not one left. Listen carefully. They didn't run out of oil. They ran out of vessels. 
Don't forget that. They never ran out. If she had got another hundred vessels, that she would have kept pouring. That was the anointing, multiplying the oil. Watch this. There is not one left. Then, then, the result of no more jars, the oil stopped. So if we had more jars, the oil would not have stopped. You with me? Next verse. Then she came in and told the man of God, and he said, give me the oil. No. He said, go sell it. Sell it. <sighs> this is one of my pet peeves. I like to get on my soapbox on this one. How many of you know we serve the same God that the Jewish people serve? Jehovah. It's the same Jehovah. He hasn't changed. How many of you know that the Jewish people totally, completely believe in prosperity? No Jew ever was taught by Jehovah to be broke. And how many Christians believe they're supposed to be broke for Jesus? That's the most ridiculous thing I heard in my life. God didn't change. The same God that wants to bless the Jews wants to bless you. The same Jewish guy that says, my God wants me to prosper, is the same God that's over you that wants you to prosper. That's why you can't think poverty anymore. No more poverty. Amen? Amen. Then she came and told the man, sell! They sell things and they make a profit. They don't sell things and lose. Sell it. Make a profit. Okay, I'm going to sell it. What are we going to do? Pay your debt. Supernatural debt cancellation was about to occur. What do I do with it? She was in debt. They were going to take her two sons for the debt. Because she, not sold a, she didn't get a few jars. She got a truckload. Now she's got her debt paid off and truckloads of money left over to live. Because we serve a God that is over and beyond whatever you could dream, think, or ask. She not only just got her debt paid off. Aha! Uh -huh, sell it, get your debt paid off, and you and your sons will live on the rest. Everybody say, I serve a God of abundance. Are you getting a hold of this? All she wanted was her debt. And what determined whether she got her debt paid and had money left over? The number of vessels. You seeing this? All right. Next verse. Actually, we could, we could stop right there. Stop right there. My brothers and sisters, what am I trying to tell you? God told me to pray for you tonight. Everybody say tonight. tonight. What am I supposed to pray for you tonight? Let me show you. I got it in here. Everybody say, he got it. He got it. I'm going to find it. Here we go. Tonight is debt cancellation night. Amen. Tonight is what? Debt. debt cancellation night. Cindy, come up here for a second. Is this turned on? It is now. Can you hear me? Cindy, I'm showing you a piece of paper. Okay? Okay. Do I need to get my glasses? <laughs> you do if you need to read the paper. Go get your glasses. <laughs> read that. Specialized loan servicing. 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 Now, wait, wait, wait. Who is it sent to? Nassar Siddiqui. Property located where? St. George Island, Florida. Can you read that? Oh, you we'll just read this part. Cancellation of debt. Where is the door? Oh. Read it. Two hundred and forty one million four hundred. No, no, no. What? Two hundred and forty one thousand. Thousand. Four hundred and eighteen. Debt cancellation letter from a bank of canceling a debt of two hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. And God told me to pull this out and share it with you tonight. Thank you. Tonight, everybody say tonight. I get my debts canceled. Just like that widow got her debts canceled. But I just don't want my debts canceled. I want to have enough left over. 
Come on. Amen. The Lord told me to pray for you tonight for supernatural debt cancellation. They issue these letters. They cancel people's debt. Everybody say, mine too. Why can't you believe for yours to be canceled? Did that widow's debt get canceled? Yeah, supernaturally. But she had the jar. And he said, not a few. You're not only can your debts get canceled tonight, but guess what? You can also have enough left over to live. Amen? God is not giving you harvest. God is giving you seed to get your debts canceled. Can I hear an amen? And what we're going to do, we are going to... Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah, it's the same one. I thought I had another one. I have three of these back there. Debt cancellation letters have been coming in. People's debt supernaturally canceled. How many of you like to have your debts canceled tonight? We're in the right place for debt cancellation tonight. Amen? Okay. We go to Luke 6.38. Give, and what happens when I give? Comes back. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over shall men. Some man cancel that debt. Some man wrote that letter and said, your debt for 241000 is canceled. If, he can, if I can get my debts canceled, you can get your debts canceled. I sowed my debt cancellation seed. That's why I got canceled. That woman had a jar of oil. That's why her debt canceled. Are you getting a hold of this? And God told me to pray for you to get your debt canceled. But then in the middle of this, Jesus said, for with the measure you give, it shall be measured back to you. You set the measure of your harvest by the measure of your seed. That's why he said to the widow, not a few. If she only had three jars, her debt wouldn't have been canceled. And she certainly wouldn't have had money left over. But because she got all the jars in the town. Everybody say, all the jars. All the jars. All the jars in the town. They couldn't find one more jar. She loaded that thing up. No wonder she had enough money left over to live on outside of her debt. Amen? So we're going to pray for that tonight. Amen? But the measure you give always sets the measure that comes back. 